Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it's my great joy to serve as the minister with this congregation, with people of all ages and at all stages of life, as we live out our effort to love inclusively, grow in body, mind, and spirit, embrace freedom, and do our part to help heal the world in all parts of our human existence in body, mind, and spirit. And part of that living includes acknowledging those who are here before us. As we begin our service, let us recognize and respect the peoples of the Peoria nation, whose ancestors welcomed and assisted the first Europeans to visit the Peoria traditional homeland, the very ground upon which we gather this morning. And I want to offer, while I have the moment here, I want to offer a special note about worship for next Sunday. Our service is Thinning the Veil. It is on Halloween, October 31st. And I want to invite folks to join me in an opportunity to remember those who have gone before, those who have been in our lives and have died. Uh, people will be uh, invited, you are invited to bring uh, mementos, small photos, think, you know, something that could fit on a table, not like a portrait, right, not a wall, uh, but something small. And you'll be invited to write names down of those who you are remembering. And also, you are welcome to send in names if you might not be able to be here in person. So I want to make sure to invite everybody to our service for next Sunday for thinning the veil. And now, Nancy Reikoff. Good morning. This is my last official time up here as membership coordinator. And uh, gives me a little bit of feeling here. I've been privileged to be the membership coordinator here for 13 years. It's been a great joy and very life-giving for me, and I really appreciate the opportunity. So the th one thing I wanted to talk about today was that I hope that you have read the flock note email message that came out yesterday from our board president, Linda Fairbanks, about what we're doing to try to keep everyone safe and still be able to gather in reasonable ways. So I want to remind us that we do keep our masks on. My golly, you look like a clown in yours, <laughs> Tim. Uh, keep our masks on during the worship services and that we also keep our mask on when we're in meetings, even though we might all have been vaccinated who are in the meeting. It's just something we're doing and keeping space from each other to try to keep each other safe because this is a beloved community. During a social hour today, uh, we've had a lot of luck to have social hours out on the patio all summer and fall, but the rain is making us stay inside today. And so we would ask that while you're picking up your beverage, you keep your mask on, and that you only remove your beverage to uh, drink your coffee or tea. The windows will be open for ventilation. And for those of you who are money conscious, yes, we know that will increase the utility bill, but it'll make our health a little bit, prospects a little bit better. Um, I would say from my own personal experience yesterday, the, back, the booster vaccines are available in Peoria very easily. So I would really encourage you to get your booster shot if you're at that stage. Thank you. Shine on me. Oh, shine on me, let the light from the lighthouse shine on me, oh, shine on me, yes, shine on me, let the light from the lighthouse, shine on me. Lift me up, oh, lift me 
Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Oh, lift me up. Yes, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Let the light, let the light from the light from the lighthouse hold me close. Yes, hold me close. So hold me close. Let the light from the lighthouse please hold me close. So oh, shine, shine on me, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light, let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Our opening words today are from Adrian Hawker's Campton. Camper. In the houses of the holy, the world pauses. In the hearts of the holy, love abides. In the havens of the holy, hope comforts. In the hearths of the holy, spirit refreshes. Come then, one and all, gather in. Come then, one and all, gather here. Bring here all of your heart. Bring here all of your body. Bring here all of your soul. Come then. Bring the broken, the vulnerable, the ragged, the outcast, the other. Come then. Gather in. Come. Come then, one and all. Gather in. Come then gather in. We light our flaming chalice as a beloved people united in love and thirsting for restorative justice. May it melt away the tethers that uphold whiteness in our midst. May it spark in us the spirit of humanity and humility. May it ignite in us radical love that transforms our energy into purposeful action. This is a chalice of audacious hope. This chalice shines a light on our shared past, signaling our intention to listen deeply, reflect wisely, and move boldly to our highest ideals. And now we have the opportunity to hear our choir for the previous recording of Here We Have Gathered. Here we have gathered, gathered side by side, circle of kinship, come and step inside. May all who seek here find a kindly word. May all who seek here feel they have been heard. Sing now together. 
everybody, I mean every body. That's what we're talking about today. Bodies are amazing from the top of every head to the tip of every toe. And today's story is about exactly that. It's called Bodies Are Cool by Tyler Felder. Big bodies, small bodies, dancing, playing, happy bodies. Look at all these different bodies. Bodies are cool. Lanky bodies, squat bodies, tall, short, wide, or narrow bodies, somewhere in the middle bodies. Bodies are cool. Round bodies, muscled bodies, curvy curves and straight bodies, jiggly wiggly fat bodies, Bodies are cool. Dark skin, olive skin, every shade of brown skin, pinky pale or peach skin, bodies are cool. Poofy hair, wavy hair, springy curls and flat hair, lots of hair or no hair, bodies are cool. Leg hair, armpit hair, Fuzzy lip and chin hair, brows meet in the middle hair. Bodies are cool. Hazel eyes, brown eyes, monolids and round eyes, blind and wearing glasses eyes. Bodies are cool. Crooked faces, bump nose faces, flat nose, full lips, gap tooth faces, stick out ears and thin lipped faces. Bodies are cool. Freckled bodies, dotted bodies, rosy patched or speckled bodies, dark skin swirled with light skin bodies. Bodies are cool. Hairy fingers, wrinkly fingers, dimpled elbows, chubby fingers, wobbly arms and stubby fingers. Bodies are cool. Soft tummies, saggy tummies, flat or sticky outy tummies. Innies, outies, pregnant tummies, bodies are cool. Thick legs, scrawny legs, knobby knees, or long legs, roll up to the table legs, bodies are cool. Faint scars, bold scars, stripes from getting bigger scars, marks that tell a story scars, bodies are cool. This body, that body, his and her and their body, however you define your body, bodies are cool. Growing bodies, aging bodies, features rearranging bodies, magic ever changing bodies, bodies are cool. My body, your body, every different kind of body, all of them, 
are good bodies. Bodies are cool. When we leave the space today, may we continue to remember that all bodies, our bodies, are cool bodies and made to be loved. So be it. In our time for sharing the joys and sorrows, I want to begin a little differently. It's cloudy, it's rainy. We've just had a lovely moment of meditation, a lovely story. But I think maybe we need a third inning stretch. There's a seventh inning stretch that's before the sermon, but this is a third inning stretch. I want to invite you to rise in body or spirit 
just kind of join me with them right now and be present and reach for that gray, beautiful sky. I know I'm from the Northeast when I'm saying gray is beautiful. And bring it on in, all that life, all that air, all that that is flowing around us and within us, and let it come on into these bodies in whatever state. There we go. Come on in, come on in, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. And we can bring ourselves in in this moment. We have, the, we have people in the space. I mean, we have church in the house. We can bring it in and bring it in. And how good it is to be with each other in all the ways that we gather, in all the ways. All right, now. Now we can have our joys and sorrows. Thank you. There is so much in our minds and on our hearts. This is the time set aside in the worship of the community when we might name our struggles and our joys. This is the time within sacred time for recognizing what troubles us, whether those troubles are in our immediate circle or in the larger world. And I want to offer, we have a couple of notes for today from the congregation. I want to offer a note of joy for, uh, from B.J. Lindsay, who is offering gratitude for six years of employment with the State of Illinois Division of Mental Health. Congratulations to B.J. for six years of wonderful employment with, with clearly a place that is a good fit and a place to be. I want to offer also a note of gratitude. Uh, yesterday, we remembered Beverly Miller, uh, who was one of the longtime members of the congregation, a wonderful elder, someone who had been part of uh, making this building happen, envisioning this space, creating this space, saying this is the color of the, of the pews and the cushions kind of presence and the walls and the foyer to create a space that was welcoming that people could come into and feel part of this community among many things that she did in her life. And I want to recognize that we celebrated her and thank everybody who was part of that, uh, all the friends and neighbors. In this case, sometimes the church becomes the family for somebody, and this was one of those moments where members of friends of the congregation said, we're going to create the service together, and we did, and shared a lot of good memories. And I also want to thank the staff in the office who helped make this possible, too, and the caring team led by Shar Ricky. Yesterday was a time of sorrow and its own joy as well. And now, let us further give, our, give, give ourselves the gift of time, knowing there is so much in our lives and on our hearts. This is the time for knowing and naming within the embrace of a caring people. What is in your mind? What weighs you down? What weighs down your heart? Well, for this moment to pause and breathe. And in this gathering, there are further, there's space for further moments of joy and abundance. Those too are with us, often irrepressible, often exciting, and sometimes complicated. Let us take a moment for gladness as well. We hold all these and much more that is in our hearts in silence, in the quiet, as I light the candles and we share our reflection.
Amen. Our reading today is something of a, a second story uh, for the purposes of our service. Um, the person that I'm really inspired by as part of the service is Sonia Renee Taylor, uh, who is the author of The Body is Not an Apology. And I wanna share a little bit about where this idea, where her story comes from for this. And this is from her, the summary is partially from her uh, website, and we'll hear more about her in the course of things. So, the body is not an apology started as a conversation between friends who were backstage at an event uh, between Sonia and her friend Natasha. Now, Natasha uh, has cerebral palsy, um, and she feared that she had an unintended pregnancy um, with someone who was a casual person in her life, was not at all wanting to be a parent. And when Sonia asked why Natasha would choose to have unprotected sex with a casual partner, Natasha replied that it was her cerebral palsy that made it difficult to be sexual in the first place and the, Natasha did not feel entitled to ask her partner to use a condom. And Sonia's response was immediate in the moment. Sonia's response was, your body is not an apology. You do not use it to say, sorry for my disability. Sonia and Natasha created in that moment what Sonia refers to as a transformational portal. They brought in three critical elements, radical honesty, radical vulnerability, and radical empathy. Radical honesty in Sonia, maybe or maybe not, it really was her business to say, so why did you have unprotected sex? But she did and radical vulnerability from Natasha to say, this is why, and radical empathy between both of them about the value of the body, and to affirm that from Sonia to Natasha and for Natasha to hear that. It was from this powerful act that the body is not an apology was born. And it was clear to Sonia that the words that she spoke to Natasha there was something powerful there. They continued to be with her, and they would not let her go. And in July of 2010, Sonia created the, the, the poem uh, untitled, The Body is Not an Apology. And I would recommend looking that up and seeing the performance of that by Sonia in particular. But then in February, on February 9th, 2011, there was a second part to this. Sonia shared a Facebook status and selfie uh, in, a, in a saucy black corset. I mean, gorgeous and hourglass and all that was. And the words, the body is not an apology, had been calling her to an examination of all the areas in her life where she was simply not living into that truth herself. I mean, you can say that, but then you've got to do something and you know, follow through with that. And Sonia understood that her beautiful, big, brown, queer body was not represented in a world as worthy of visibility or desire. And yet, and yet, she chose to post this photo where she felt like the embodiment of desire and power. She was feeling herself. And this terribly frightening act, like, let's, let's just kind of say it is not a a quiet thing to do. But this terribly frightening act birthed the outlandishly simple idea that no human being should be ashamed of their human body. And 
less than 24 hours after posting that photo, the movement was born. People were sharing their own photos from all over the world and their stories as well. Uh, feeling people sharing photos of empowered, completely perfectly imperfect bodies by age and race and size and gender and ability and disability, orientation, religion, ethnicity, class, and so much more. How humans show up being human. And they were willing to exist unapologetically in that moment. And Sianyo felt moved by that response to create a whole new space so people could practice living without apology in their bodies. There's the unapologetic posse is one of the bodies that's come from this, the unapologetic posse that I think is a worldwide bunch of people. And Sonia went on to create platforms for people to connect and keep doing this work of transformation and liberation and radical self-love because the body is not an apology. Our next hymn is, I Wish I Knew How, and speaks to that wishing to get out of ourselves and wishing for liberation. When was the last time you felt that your body was completely confident and affirmed? When was the last time that your body felt completely confident and affirmed? And when, when did that affirmation leave? How did it go away?
I think one of our most precious places of wonder and affirmation of the body is, is when we see babies around us and how they have this glorious emerging discovery of fingers and toes and hands and just all of that. The toddlers, toddlers take it to a next level because their body is their glory. They revel in it. They revel in the belly in particular. If you watch a toddler with their belly, their belly. Yes, I have a belly. And yes, it is my source of power. I lead with my belly. I lead with my belly. You know, they have access to it. It is theirs and it is round and wonderful. They literally are centered in their belly. It is how part of how they, how very young children take up space entirely as they are. I think it's one of their inherent superpowers. Until they learn otherwise, until they are taught at some point that love can be conditional upon appearance and function and location until they hear and see and are told that worth is based on certain margins and lines until they absorb the message from the constant stream of images and promotions that they should wonder whether their body measures up and whether their sense of self might fall short along with their body. It just, just, just this morning, as I'm finishing putting this together, on my social media feed, there was this ad for weight loss based on intermittent fasting, which may work just fine for some folks. This is not about that. The fasting images were according to body type, you know, it starts with the small belly, but then there's the gluten belly, the alcohol belly, the mommy belly, the hormonal belly. Like, which hormone is going to, are you picking on with that belly? All except small in the imagery were various incarnations of round and protruding, a little up, a little down, a little wide, a little out. And all of those shapes were entirely, are entirely within the range of how our human bodies show up, no matter what restrictions we place on ourselves. Now, how, do, how matter, how much we control our diet, for example. That belly part of a toddler's superpowers, I think it is a center of strength. It is theirs. And I continually wonder, what can I do to reduce that negative language, that negative self-talk for myself and keep that talk, that voice from showing up in how I relate to others, whether it's my children or whether it's people of any age anybody I encounter, because once we get that picking on the belly kind of conversation, it takes that much more work to silence those voices. How can I take the effort of welcome and worth that I know is the better course, is the truly healthier course, is the course that I would want for any child, no matter what age we are, and bring it out into the world beyond myself. This month's theme is cultivating relationship, and I wanted to turn to our closest one, that with our bodies, ourselves, and our mind and spirit as as all are interconnected. And one of the most powerful and glorious voices that I've been finding for that is from Sonia Renee Taylor, who is a queer black woman. 
She is the founder and ex radical executive officer. She says, when you make the company, you get to claim your title. So she is the radical executive officer of the body is not an apology, which is an international movement committed to radical self-love and body empowerment as the foundational tool for social justice and global transformation. I mean, you know, she started over here with a conversation and now has taken it global because clearly we need this conversation. She is a poet, an activist, and a transformational leader. And she speaks about, she talks about the radical honesty, the radical vulnerability, the radical empathy. And she goes on to talk about what she means by radical and the kind of the definition of that. You get to get at the core, at the root of the origin of what you're engaged with, the fundamental nature, the radical difference. You know, radical, and as she was talking about, is like the, the deepest, the most extreme, um, the radical change in policy in a company, for example. Moving away from traditional forms and figuring out what's really needed and wanted. And radical also is favoring drastic political, economic, and social reforms. Radical ideas upending the, the order that has been created, the normal that we have found in this pandemic is not a great normal for so many of us. What exists, radical as what exists inherently in a thing or person, the radical worth inside. She said, we believe self-love is the root or origin of our relationship to ourselves, and we come to this planet as love. I love this almost as much as the body is not an apology. We come to this planet as love, she says. And boy, has our planetary experience in recent days been a test of worth and self. in our in part of what we're working with and, and, and having to navigate in our world, um, however we go forward, whatever phase of pandemic we are going forward into, I think there's, there's effort at figuring out the conflict and the messages and the relationships with our bodies and ourselves all over again. From forced confinement and separation, which had deep impact on us, and some of it for good. Some people were able to have safer spaces because they were away from people, as well as the isolation that has led to so much struggle mentally and emotionally and physically for so many of us as well. We've been less, in so many ways, less visible to each other. Because for some folks, being out in the world is indeed a radical act because their body is not the norm, not what is expected, and simply being in the world challenges expectations and assumptions. And so having to be separated from one another has made, in some ways, made us less visible in our daily lives. But what's also happened, and I think the body is not an apology, has been kind of adding a layer, has seen a return of that, or. Uh, a conversation about this. And it's certainly something that I've been learning in the course of the last year or two years, is that people are turning to each other wherever they can find connection and are making more connections and discovering more solidarity with one another, discovering stories that they might not have yet encountered by their neighbors physically, but they might encounter a neighbor on the other side of the world who is saying, this is my body and I am worthy. And that's leading to new understanding and new commitment to saying we are all impacted by how we love ourselves. We have legacies and legacies of how our bodies have been regarded and treated. And we know this in talking about oppression and justice in systems when it's in our bodies, it is feeling a direct impact of that. 
that author Sabrina Strings brings out one of those pieces of history. Uh, one source of fat phobia, for example, that interconnects with so many others. In her book, Fearing the Body, Radical Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. So Fearing the Body, Racial Origins of Fat Phobia by Sabrina Strings. When she was working in healthcare uh, during the AIDS crisis, she was trying to get um, having black women take the drugs that would help take care of their um, help take care of their health while they're HIV positive, and the women, many of the women she was encountering were refusing to do so because they'd heard that the drugs would make you gain weight. So, so you have these women, black women, who were refusing the drugs that could save their lives because they were concerned about their weight. What a choice. What a choice. And this, this led Ms. Strings to, to do the research. And what she found is that way back at the beginning of when African people were brought, uh, enslaved and brought into this land, um, and be among the white Europeans, it was easy to tell who was white and who was black and, and who belonged in what part of society. And that was all by skin color. But as social contact will tend to do, after 200 years of mingling, people were more multiracial and differently had a different range of skin color. It was less distinct. And so over time, there was a gradual, how do we still keep people separate from each other? And 200 years later, after people were in, started to be in this country, you know, people who are of African descent and white Europeans are in this country, you start to see texts in Harper's Bazaar of how to be white and thin and female, that you control your diet and how to control one's diet so that one could maintain one's thinness, which was also interconnected with whiteness and being female. And that how that gradually became the standard for beauty. And so you have colorism, racism, and fat phobia, and gender all entirely intertwined. And that's just one way that we've received a legacy of messages about our bodies. I want to offer that body positivity, feeling good and better about ourselves, would be one outcome of such a conversation. The body is not an apology. By all means, feeling good about yourself, really important. Recovering some of that that early, early childhood superpower of self? Absolutely. But there's a larger point. There's a larger point. We also, whatever we feel about ourselves, there's also the opportunity and the call to go beyond any one of us, but to all of us, to the liberation of all bodies and go beyond, use our bodies to champion everybody's bodies. Go beyond the socialized shame that is one of those waters in which we swim and don't always realize it is there. And we talk about this in church. We talk about the body and our relationship with health as in some ways a radical act, a countercultural act in our society. We have a countercultural act, I'm going to tell you, is happening after service today. Because our whole lives, which is our comprehensive sexuality education program, with programs for every age and stage of life, that we have that coming up in our religious education program starting in November. And this afternoon after service is the parent orientation. The parents will be radicalized this afternoon. Hallelujah. Because our whole lives is talking about the ownership of the self, about consent, 
empowerment, the affirmation of curiosity and discovery and wonder in all these aspects of our lives, certainly grounded in the body. As my colleague C.B. Beale says, bodies are awesome. Everyone should get one. And we do this work of liberation, getting to the radicalness at the heart of our self-love, because doing so makes it easier, helps us facilitate and recognize when bodies are not respected and regarded, because black lives matter, because disabled bodies matter, older bodies matter, younger bodies matter, female and male and transgender bodies matter. Bodies of all shapes and sizes and configurations matter. And the impact of oppression is lived in our bodies. We feel it in every moment, whether we know it or not. As Sonia Renee Taylor says, oppression, the fruits of oppression is on our body. You know, those women in the H in the AIDS clinic making a choice against health because of how they've been told to regard their body. Or just in our moment today, who does or doesn't have access to a vaccine, right? There's folks around the world who have not had a chance to be vaccinated because of how health and bodies and value and race have been intertwined. Justice shows up in the body when we are generous, when we give and serve, when we assist one another, when we show up in our community and say racism is wrong, when we show up in our community and want to offer a better quality of life and be part of listening to others who have to who know where their quality of life, what that should look like, and then go and say, how can we help make that better together? Justice shows up in our body when we resist our own shame. Justice shows up in our body when we resist our own shame and see the internalized shame around us and recover the superpowers within us and practice what we call for, the liberation, the expansion of freedom, the love that is inclusive, the growth in mind, body, and spirit, and being part of building a beloved community within ourselves, around in our circle, and out and all around to do our part to help heal the world. The body is not an apology. And we are here as embodiments of love. Let us live that and practice that for ourselves and out into the world. Amen. Our closing hymn. I'm going to invite you to rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn because it says do when the spirit says do. So we can actually maybe listen to the song and do a little bit of what the spirit says do. So please rise and body your spirit and I invite you to follow the hymn. Spirit.
Spirit says sing. 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 You gotta dance when the spirit says dance. You gotta dance when the spirit says dance. When the spirit says dance. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And let us go forth, being the beautiful, spectacular, precious, embodied people that we are, that we bring a little bit of that love into our hearts, into our circle, and out into the world. Let us go forth. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin.